and welcome to episode 138 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with Tom Hucker, Montgomery County Council member representing District 5 in Montgomery County, Maryland, and a first Democratic state delegate representing District 20 in Silver Spring in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm good. Great. The first question I'd like to pose to you is what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? <laughs> um, uh, boy, well, I've spent my whole uh, adult life as, a, you know, as an organizer and, and activist, um, you know, including as an uh, elected official. Um, I, during college and then shortly after college, worked in the environmental movement for many years, um, you know, on federal legislation like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, on state legislation to clean up toxic waste dumps and other environmental problems. And uh, and then I worked uh, for years as a community organizer and created my own uh, group in Maryland, which uh, was designed to build power for working families. And it brought together about uh, 40 different community groups and unions and churches um, and about 15,000 individual members to uh, um, push at mo- somewhat at the local level, mostly in Annapolis for state legislation that would benefit working families, like uh, living wages we pushed for for years, the Purple Line, um, the Affordable Care Act, and expanded health care. And, uh, and then in 2006, uh, I uh, was persuaded by a lot of people to run for the, uh, the House of Delegates, and I served there for eight years, and then uh, two years ago, I was elected to the county council. So, you know, I spent uh, a lot of time as an organizer and now a lot of time on the council and in the assembly passing dozens of bills that, that you know, help the environment, raise wages for working families, um, and uh, expand health care and transit and other protections, basically, for people's quality of life. Well, you know, Tom, um, a lot of individuals uh, get get involved as, as volunteers in their community. They become potentially involved as community organizers. A lot of people feel passionately about the environment, but not many of those individuals become entrepreneurs and start their own nonprofit, as you did as the founder of Progressive Maryland. Can you speak for a minute to our listeners about what inspired you to create your own organization and then how you became so successful at pulling together 14,000 members over the course of only a few years as a leader and founder of Progressive Maryland? Um, sure. I, um, I guess I had, um, worked with several different, um, you know, neighborhood groups and, and also a sort of nascent coalition of, um, unions and community groups and, uh, just other activists from different groups, but, uh, um, in a nascent sort of coalition in Montgomery County that was interested in, uh, working on countywide issues. And, uh, I, I mean, I think one thing that, that, um, is under, uh, valued, I guess, in a lot of casual meetings of, uh, you know, of activists is the need for sustainable funding and, uh, eventually to hire staff so you can do, you know, serious, um, work year round, uh, not just have meetings in the evenings when people are off work and have time, but, uh, you know, somebody really needs to be, if you're going to be an effective group, you really need staff to be working, uh, organizing other volunteers and recruiting new members and, um, advocating for your agenda, you know, during the day when most elected officials and policymakers are, you know, open to persuasion and, and having hearings and things like that on public issues. So, um, we, uh, w- you know, we started raising money, uh, from uh, a few Montgomery County organizations first to form what we called Progressive Montgomery. And then after several years of advocating in Montgomery County, we realized that there were not, uh, any groups like us advocating for working families issues at the state level. And the progressives uh, in Maryland, like they are in a lot of places, are sort of balkanized. There, you know, there's a cluster of progressive activists in the Baltimore area. Um, there's a few scattered around other counties. There's some in Metro D.C. and you know, Montgomery and St. George's, but nothing that really knitted them together into a statewide organization. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, we we started holding meetings in 1990 to do that. I'm sorry, uh, in 2000 to do that, and then um, you know took took the better part of a year to create a statewide organization. Interesting. So a lot of times you find that in coalition building, some elements as some different stakeholders, as you mentioned, could be balkanized, can be fractured, really 
focused on issues in their own backyard, whether it's chicken manure on the eastern shore, uh, um, oyster farmers in southern Maryland, um, air conditioning units in Baltimore County public schools. How is it that you were able, uh, or was it not difficult, to try to unify um, individuals with disparate priority lists uh, behind one set statewide agenda for all of Maryland um, to support working families? Um, that, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, on certainly on the broadly defined, you know, left, um, most people have, uh, you're right, an issue agenda around the interests of their organization, and they have other things they care about um, that would help their, their members um, but are, are less important, um, but, you know, might help a greater good. So um, I I was really careful to create Progressive Maryland in a way that avoided, I think, some of the mistakes of other organizations. I, I, I went through a lot of um, community groups and unions and other, and, you know, sort of made the pitch that uh, we weren't a renter rent mob, you know, essentially. We weren't a bunch of people that uh, you could just call and show up for your hearing um, and didn't didn't have any um, any uh, un, you know underpinning that held the organization together uh, except the service of its organizational members. What we tried to do was to get organizations to agree, that regardless of whatever their top one or two or three priorities in Annapolis might be, that there were broader issues like health care or like living wages um, or or you know expanded transit. It might affect a much larger number of people, um, might not be the top issue on their members' agenda, but were something that their members would, uh, would support, and, and challenge them to get behind a larger shared agenda, um, you know, to help create the organization. So, um, you know, and, and not everybody said yes. A lot of groups are just very focused on their small agenda, and they're frustrated by their lack of power, um, and, you know, they, but they don't want to work on something else. And, uh, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, we built the organization with groups that um, were willing to work on a larger agenda as well you know, as a way to give themselves a share in a larger organization um, that could build power over time. So, Tom, I'd like to talk, to build on this idea of coalition building um, by speaking about the topic of infringement on turf. What I mean by this is I'm going to take a, um, an anecdote, a little story of uh, the last few years in Maryland. A few years ago, Maryland state legislature, of which you were a part, uh, legalized marriage equality, essentially permitting uh, same-sex marriages. There was an advocacy organization called Equality Maryland that mm -hmm. primary reason for existence was really advocating to get this to become law. Once it became law, eventually they ended up shutting down their shop, though there still are many different fights to be fought to advance uh, LGBT rights. Um, they really had their reason for existence um, removed, and they ended up shutting down. The reason I mentioned this is because when you build a coalition, if Progressive Maryland begins to become successful in advocating for a living wage, and of course the Montgomery County Council and the state of Maryland have both increased um, minimum wages in the last few years, um, and there's okay. obviously current efforts to do that more. The question is, do you obviate the need for other organizations to exist? And if so, then you find that some organization, or have you found that some organizations have resisted joining you because they want to perpetuate their existence, and it's more important for them to remain relevant than it is for them to advance their issue. So did you face any kind of resistance to joining Progressive Maryland by those who may get subsumed into this larger umbrella group that you created? Mm, not, not that I can remember. I mean, I, I, I know the phenomenon you're talking about is some groups, you know, can be sort of turfy, um, for lack of a better term. But, but yeah, there, you know, like I said, there wasn't really a statewide group working on working family issues. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, we tried to fill that void. Um, and, you know, to just be assiduous about making sure the work we were doing had some value added um, to all the uh, organizations. And some organizations, um, you know, benefited more than others from the, um, you know, being part of a larger coalition. But, um, you know, on most of the issues, uh, the, you know, uh, members, you know, did, didn't benefit directly because, like, the members of most unions 
and mm-hmm. most even middle class community organizations aren't uh, low wage workers on a state contract that were you know affected by our state living wage bill. But they um, you know they saw value in being part of a larger organization because um, when they had a bill before the county council or the state legislature, you know they, being being part of Progressive Maryland allowed them a forum where they could build relationships with groups that they didn't have relationships with previously. And, um, you know, like the old, the old thing is, you know, you, you don't, um, it's the, the worst time to, you know, make a new friend is when you, when you need a friend, you want to build all your friendships, uh, before you need them. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, organizations that had an issue they were trying to pass or might have been under, uh, attack for one thing or the other, you know, they were, they were glad to have, uh, New relationships with um, with community groups that they really had no, you know, uh, other other place to to meet them and to do shared work together. Um, and and uh, a lot of people found that very valuable. Um, you know, when they when they would come to Progressive Maryland Organ, for example. So I'd like to transition a little bit back towards you personally, Tom. You've been an advocate for working families. I'd like to discuss how you arrived at that point as as being an advocate for working families and double a little bit into your personal life. You do have a wife, you have two uh, young children, yet obviously when you started Progressive Maryland uh, back in 2000, you did not have two young children. Can you speak a little bit about what led you to really uh, identify with working families and seek to become their champion uh, in the state legislature? Um. I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, growing up, I um, grew up in a working class neighborhood and, and um, you know, we had a, a stable family and a lot of uh, assets that, that a lot of people, you know, have to go without. But um, I think, um, uh, you know, the more I, um, I mean, I, was, I guess I was sort of taught, taught by my parents or, or uh, whomever to, uh, uh you know, to to, uh, to be concerned about, you know, uh, what people call the little guy or the disadvantaged or whatever. And, um, um, you know, I, my focus has been, you know, I think less to do sort of, you know, take a charitable approach to, you know, poverty and other issues, but really to help people um, build influence collectively so they could make their government uh, work as well as it was supposed to work, you know, for them. Um, to make their government responsive, and you know when you when you train as a community organizer, you, you that's that's what you're doing all day. You're trying to get you know a local council member uh, if uh, that's your, who your target is, or or it might be a company um, to respond to a collective uh, request from you know from the group you're building up. And uh, um, you know I guess doing that for years maybe you know appreciate just the, the value of. Uh, um, of organizing and, and collective action. I was going to go to, um, I had planned originally, um, no, knowing just growing up and thinking I wanted to help people, but in a very apolitical way, I was going to go to med school and hmm. I, you know, was pre-med all through college. Um, but it was a campaign when I was a sophomore in college, uh, and I was involved with an environmental group and, uh, we, in Massachusetts, uh, where I went to school, we could petition issues onto the ballot um, that the state assembly hadn't taken, um, you know, made a decision on. So at the time, Massachusetts had hundreds of toxic waste sites around the state, and there were dozens of communities that couldn't drink their own drinking water um, out of the tap because it was so contaminated by toxic waste uh, in the groundwater. And um, uh, many, there were, there were, I forget the numbers, but, you know, Many people, of course, a dozen or more dying, you know, associated with uh, cancers from polluted drinking water every day. And the state... Was that documented in that movie with John Travolta? Oh, well, you know, it's funny. I was in Boston College in Woburn, where that movie was, was just a town or two away. But the problem in Woburn um, was really, um, you know, captured in a book in the movie, but uh, was really common all over, was all over the... Um, uh, the state, and you know, really all over an awful lot of northeastern states that had a big industrial base. So um, the, my, the lesson for me was the assembly had not acted on, had not put together an effective plan to clean up the toxic waste in Massachusetts. So we petitioned a bill that we had that had not passed um, mm-hmm. onto the ballot, and the public passed it by an overwhelming majority. So hmm. it sort of made me realize 
Um, I could spend, you know, uh, my future in a lab trying to come up with a cure for cancer that many other smart people had never been able to come up with. Or uh, I might be, you know, able to affect more people, uh, you know, prevent more people from getting cancer um, by, by organizing to pass more laws like that. Um, because if you did the math, you know, we were really having you – know, that law alone had a big impact on uh, an awful lot of people's lives. So, um, sure. and that was, and it was fun to do. You know, we just gathered the signatures, put it on the ballot, campaigned for it, and people, you know, it's nice to be validated and to know people actually agree with you. And, uh, you know, passed by about 70% plus margin. Uh, Michael Dukakis was getting uh, reelected that year, and we got a lot more votes than he did. So, you know, it was, it was, uh, um, it was empowering for me to learn that, well, you, you, I could be part of a campaign that just makes a new law that saves lives. And if I could do that, uh, why wouldn't I want to, you know, keep doing that with, uh, you know, with my jobs out of college? So that's where I, I decided not to go to medical school and to, to uh, do environmental work afterwards. There's a slogan at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health that says, saving lives billions at a time, whereas medicine saves lives one at a time. It sounds like that slogan uh, applies uh, a little bit to your work. You were seeking to prevent cancer on a population level, and you saw success in a ballot measure as an advocate. Is it fair to say that that campaign first is what got you interested in environmental matters, which continues to uh, be of interest to you in your career as you've been a consultant for the Natural Resources Defense Council? Or did your interest in environmental uh, activism predate your involvement in that ballot measure campaign? Um, no, that was really influential. I think I had, um, you know, canvassed and gone door to door where I grew up in St. Louis, you know, before I got involved with that campaign uh, for the environment. But, uh, you know, both, I mean, both of those things, initially going door to door to, you know, to uh, uh, clean up tax waste in Missouri and then, and then that ballot campaign in Massachusetts, both of those really, you know, contributed to sort of my, my view of the world and uh, my appreciation for, um, you know, the power of uh, collective grassroots action to, uh, ha- you know, to, to force uh, uh, elected officials to, uh, to do the right thing and to, to create change. So we spoke earlier about the, your desire to build collective influence to create responsive government. Now, you mm-hmm. are in quite a unique position, Tom. Not only have you created your own grassroots movement in the state of Maryland, um, which continues to exist to this day, but then you also served in the Maryland House of Delegates and now the Montgomery County Council. So two levels of government plus a grassroots activist. My question for you on this topic is, in making a transition from being an advocate and a grassroots organizer to being an elected official in the House of Delegates to then becoming an elected official in Montgomery County on the County Council, have you experienced any change in perspective? Is there anything that you've seen in one uh, uh, with one identity that you did not expect in your previous identity? And is there anything that you wish you knew um, in a previous role that you now have learned through the various offices that you have held? Um, wow, that's a big question. Um, is there anything I wish I'd known in a previous role? Um, uh, I, I mean, I think serving as an elected official makes, um, gives you an appreciation of being, uh, both the level of detail that is often needed to make a good piece of legislation and the, uh, I, I, I'm not good at being patient, but it gives me an appreciation of the value of patience. Um, you know, a lot of, and I, I, you could just probably imagine with the background I have, the, you know, I, I end up dealing with um, grassroots advocates quite a, quite a bit, and um, um, the, you know they ask, some of them ask me to put you know their bills in. Some of them ask you know a lot of them ask me to you know support their bills, obviously. And I end up you know um, probably unfortunately for them giving them a lot of unsolicited advice about their their advocacy because you know when you're when you're on this side of the the dais, you realize uh, you kind of become good at you know separating effective advocacy from not you know, from ineffective advocacy and um, the advocates that I think do the, you know, the best job, um, not only, you know, build power out in the field, um, but really cultivate good relationships with elected officials so that they can be um, seen as experts in their area and so they can be seen as persuasive. And, um, you know, a lot of that is their demeanor 
and you know, sort of presentation um, because, you know, I when I was an advocate, and I, I still do, you know, as an elected official, I have to get my colleagues to vote for things. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I try to really not let anything get personal, to, um, you know, not be surprised when people disagree, um, and to just try to, you know, use the all the arguments you have and the facts you have to persuade people without um, becoming disagreeable um, or damaging your relationships because um, um, it, it's, a, it's a finite audience. You know, it, in the Montgomery County Council, it takes nine votes. It, it, there's nine of us, so it takes five votes to pass a bill and six to have a veto for the majority. And um, somebody that might vote against my bill, you know, this week, I might need them on my bill next week. So there's no point in, you know, getting angry about the position they take. That's really up to them. And, um, you know, I try to uphold one thing you learn in the House of Delegates, which is not to stand up and impugn people's motivations and say, oh, they're taking that position because of their campaign contributor or because they're just insensitive or something. Um, you know, we all have different experiences, and I don't claim to know anybody else's experience at all, just my own. So, um, you know, if I can't persuade them to support one bill, I just try to um, you know, see them as an individual and uh, um, hopefully listen to them enough to figure out if there's some arguments uh, maybe that I am not using that might persuade them. And if I don't get them on this bill, I um, still try to maintain a good personal relationship so I can try and persuade them on the next bill. So on the change of perspective question, there must have been a time when, as an advocate, you were frustrated with elected officials. Do you have any more sympathy for those elected officials that you worked with in Annapolis and in Boston? Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, and the sympathy is the right way. I, I certainly understand, you know, I think where they're coming from, but, um, mm-hmm. I guess that part's never been as hard for me as for some other advocates. Uh, yeah, I, I right now have, um, you know, I mean, good friends, uh, among with, you know, some elected officials that have never voted for any of my bills and other elected officials that, you know, um, were the targets of an advocacy campaign that I was leading that, you know, got pretty heated and, and they got pretty frustrated with the uh, postcards and emails and letters I was getting sent to their office. Um, but, um, you know, now now we're good friends because I think they, they understand and, and I certainly have always understood, well, I have a job and they have a job. And, um, um, you know, we, we just try to, uh, per, I just try to persuade them and, you know, move on to the next thing, like, as I said. So, Tom, we're actually approaching the end of the podcast right now, and so I'd like to ask you one last final question, sure. which is to speak to our listeners about why you've done it, why you've dedicated decades to advancing the public interest, often in a non-remunerated volunteer capacity, often as an overworked, underpaid um, activist, <laughs> and now um, as, as an elected official in, in two separate capacities. Could you speak to our listeners about why it's been worthwhile and what, at the end of the day, you hope your legacy will be? What will you have accomplished through all that you've given to public service throughout the course of your career? Wow. You have big questions, Jordan. Um, I, I mean, I think I got into it, as I said, to, um, you know, just sort of help people in a vague way. And the more you learn about, you know, uh, the, the structures of power in our society, you realize that um, that there's a lot of unfairness and inequity and there's a lot of structural reasons that people don't have, you know, um, the quality of life that they would like to have and, and uh, um, that, you know, that organizing and, and uh, collective action and, and, and uh, well-crafted legislation all can be tools to, you know, improve people's quality of life. So, you know, the more I got into it, the more I, um, you know, just become satisfied doing the work. I think the work is, is fun to do. It's not every fun every minute of every day, but I don't know any job that is. And, it really, um, you know, it's a great privilege to um, be able to be in the position that I'm in on the council and to work with the people that I get to work with um, who are all very smart and dedicated in their, you know, in their own right. And uh, many of them know much more about all kinds of different issues than, you know, than I know. And um, it's, a, it's a great environment to work in where you have the ability to improve a lot of people's lives, um, you know, really every day. And, um, you know, that's – so, and, you know, another thing is uh, – it just it suits my personality, um, you know, to, to have the opportunity to be a generalist a little bit. I mean, I, I don't think I could be a college professor and just, you know, specialize in medieval Italian literature, um, you know, exclusively and be a world expert on that and very, very few other things. 
um, in this job, you really have to you learn uh, um, at least a little bit, hopefully a moderate amount, about a lot of different things. And, you know, on the council, just as in the state assembly, we're dealing with environmental issues and transportation issues and healthcare issues and service delivery. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I like that. It certainly keeps the work very interesting as well as being very satisfying. And that has been Tom Hucker, Montgomery County Council Member from District 5 and former delegate from District 20 in Montgomery County, Maryland, and the founder of Progressive Maryland. Tom speaks about his time in public service as an advocate for the little guy who's gone out there and found found success in building collective influence to create responsive government. He has since become part of government, and his interest in making it more responsive to people is driven by his desire to advocate for working families, for the environmental movement, um, and to really be a coalition builder who understands real politics and is okay with building coalitions with individuals who are allies today and foes tomorrow, and he recognizes that today's foes may very well be tomorrow's allies. He is a generalist who takes pleasure in maximizing his opportunity to uh, have a positive impact across society, regardless of the issue. Um, And in that capacity, as an advocate, as someone who stands up for for someone who doesn't quite have the strongest voice out there and as as a representative of a diverse coalition of individuals, progressive individuals across the nation, from Missouri to Massachusetts to Maryland, Tom has worked to advance the public interest through his life of public service as an advocate, as an elected official, and as an advocate for the every man. Tom, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for the opportunity, Jordan. That was a great recap. And this has been episode 138 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Remember to subscribe at publicinterestpodcast.com. Listen on iTunes, your podcast app, SoundCloud, Blueberry, Player FM, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Stitcher. Should you wish to communicate with Tom, you can leave him a voicemail at 240-630-0380. That voice.